I invite you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, please, to the book of Philippians. It's halfway between Romans and Revelations, all right? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, chapter 1. And we'll be reading a few verses out of there in just a few minutes. Uh, if you've been here with us all summer, you know we're engaged in a series called Joy and Laughter. You never can have too much. You can only have too little. We spent the first few weeks looking at laughter, and now we're looking at the source of all of that, which is joy. Joy is not an outward expression. That is laughter. Joy is to be an inward reality in our life. And joy actually is not a verb. It is a noun. Uh, you find that the word joy is used as a noun in describing who Jesus is. He is our unspeakable joy. And joy is not hinged to our events in life. All right, that's happiness. Happiness is the hinge based upon our circumstances. We're happy or we are not happy. Joy is something that functions in us in spite of the circumstances around us. And so as we look at this foundation and fountain of joy, we're looking at it from this little book in the New Testament written by a man in prison. So he was not in the most happiest of circumstances, and yet he writes to us with great authority on this whole subject of joy. And so uh, we're going to begin reading at verse 12, and we're going to read through verse 21. We started this, uh, this section last week, and we're going to move a little further in it this week. So follow along with me if you would like. Paul says, now I want you to know, brothers... And he also means sisters. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know that what has happened to me, being put in prison, has really served to advance the gospel. Now, that's the opposite of what we think, right? We would think being sent to prison is probably going to limit your opportunity of sharing the gospel. Not true. In fact, I could probably have a show of hands and you'd be surprised at how many in here found Jesus in prison. Hey, it's amazing the work of the gospel that can be done behind prison walls, and Paul's engaged in it now. He says in verse 13, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard, and this is in Rome, and to everybody else that I'm in chains because of Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. And again, you would think it would be the opposite. One of your buddies is in prison, and he's in prison because he was preaching the gospel. Whoa, I better shut up. Paul said, no, the opposite has happened. It's, we got more folks out there sharing the gospel than ever before. That's exciting. They were courageous and fearless. Next verse, it is true that some of those who are out there preaching Christ are doing so out of envy and rivalry, but others are doing it out of goodwill. Paul, what do you have to say about those who are doing it for the wrong reasons? The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains, thinking they can take advantage of my not being there. And how does Paul feel about that? It doesn't matter. The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true ones, Christ is preached. And for this, I'll rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. What kind of deliverance are you going to have, Paul? I will eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, that I will become cowardice, but I will have sufficient courage so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body. Listen to this, whether by life or by death. Paul said, I'll be delivered one way or the other. I'm positive I'll be delivered. My deliverance may come by my death. How do we face the circumstances of life? And then Paul comes up with his favorite verse. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. It's better. 
So how do we face the adversity of our lives? Paul outlines for us in this group of verses at least seven proven principles as we face trouble and adversity for ourselves. Let me outline very quickly the seven. We talked about two last week. We're going to talk about two more today. Number one, adversity. And I'm going to go slower for those of you who said, Tim, you went way too fast last week. But I told you I was. All right. So I'll give it to you a little slower today. Here's the seven points. Principles we use when we face trouble and adversity. Number one, and the first word for all of them is the same word, so I'll give you a little shortcut. Just put ditto underneath as you make your list here, all right? Adversity promotes the progress of evangelism, sharing our faith. In other words, there's good news in spite of the bad news. Adversity promotes the progress of evangelism. Number two, adversity provides opportunity for personal sharing. Last week we saw how Paul had Roman guards on his right and his left. They were there six hours a day, seven days a week, and he got to share, and some of them came to know Christ. Number three, adversity produces courage in our faith family, our church. Adversity produces courage in our faith family, his church. We'll look at that today. Second thing we'll look at today is number four. Adversity proves the character of our relationships. Is it good character? (laughs) Is it bad character? Few bad characters out there. Not just, just kidding. Number five, adversity provokes maturity in our lives. It stirs us towards maturity. Number six, adversity purifies our motives. We may have started with impure motives, but in the process of adversity, those motives are purified. Number seven, adversity prepares us with a new perspective about living and about dying. So those are seven proven principles Paul teaches us in this passage. Um, When I preach, I love to do a couple of things. One, I hope you learn more about the Bible. Number two, I hope you learn more about life. Number three, I also hope you'll learn more about the world. And as I'm getting older, I discover I like the last part as much as I almost do the other part. I uh, yesterday, young man came over. Uh, He he just he bought my Explorer, so I could drive around in my bright red pickup truck now. But it's not here. I'm back driving my my butt kicked in Fiat, all right? Um, Did I just say butt out loud? All right, the back end looks like it's been kicked in. Um, And uh, he had texted me for directions to my house. Well, he's been to my house at least twice in the last month or so. And I'm thinking, you grew up in Clovis, you've been to my house twice. Why in the world don't you know how to get to my house? So intentionally, I didn't really give him my street address because I didn't really want him to just use Google. Okay? I said, I'm a block north of Alluvial and a block west of Peach. So when he got to the house, I said, do you know which way north is? Good job! (laughs) Now his sister was there. She's got eyes like this. I looked at her, and she's about to drive. I said, do you know which way north is? She said, Pastor Tim, I don't have a clue. So we had a little lesson about north and south and east and west. I said, as you're driving, as you're riding with your parents now, as you're learning with your learner's permit, as you drive down the road, start memorizing the streets. I said, know that, you know, it's it's Willow, and it's Maple, and it's Chestnut, and it's Cedar, and it's Millbrook, and it's First, and it's Fresno, and it's Blast. I said, you're going to be driving. You need to know where you... I said, you get stranded, you need to tell somebody. Not all of us parents have a GPS on our phone of where our kids are all the time. But if you have teenagers, you want to get one of them dudes, all right? <laughs> you ought to have one, all right? Um... So, so anyway, it's, it's important for us to learn things. So one of the things, how many of you, when I say Martin Luther, you know exactly who I'm talking about? How many of you think I'm talking about Martin Luther King Jr.? Okay, yeah, I'm not, all right? He's a good man, did some great things, all right? Martin Luther, 
this is one probably this Martin Luther is probably top 20 in the history of the world maybe okay I mean this that Martin Luther is big 1500s all right he started out as a monk and then a priest he was a theologian uh, been raised everything Catholic and then he made the mistake of reading the book of Romans and when he read the book of Romans, he discovered that things he had been teaching as a priest were wrong. He discovered in the book of Romans that salvation is a free gift of God's grace. And as a result, eternal life is a gift to any man, woman, boy, or girl, whether they have the name of Catholic on them or not. If they have a relationship with Jesus Christ, they are born again. His theology challenged the authority and the office of the Pope at that time. Because he was teaching now that the only divine source of revealed knowledge is the Bible and nothing else. The Bible alone is God's authority. He began teaching that all Christians who by faith had invited Christ into their life were now part of the holy priesthood. It wasn't just a select few. Those who identified with all of these teachings of Martin Luther became known as what? Lutherans, that's some of you, all right? You're recovering Lutherans now, all right? That's, that, that's what John Longstaff tells about himself, all right? He said, I'm a recovering Lutheran. Do you know what? Martin Luther hated that title. He did his best to discourage folks from being called Lutherans. He said, we ought to be called Christians. He said, it has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with Christ. His refusal to renounce all of these writings at the demand of Pope Leo X in 1520 and then the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V at that wonderful event called the Diet of Worms. That's a real event. You ought to look it up and read about it someday. I don't have time to educate you on that one. This resulted, though, in Martin Luther's excommunication by the Pope, and he was condemned as an outlaw by the emperor. Now, I told you all that just so I can tell you a, a funny story. It's a true story. This Christian reformer who had been kicked out of the Catholic Church and excommunicated from, from Rome, he found himself in a three-day period of deep, dark depression. It was over some things that had gone wrong in his life, maybe like getting kicked out of his home. On the third day of this depression, his wife came down the stairs of their home dressed completely in black morning clothes. And as she comes down the steps, Martin Luther looks up at her and says, Who's dead? And his wife responded, God. And Martin Luther said, Darling, what do you mean God is dead? God can't die. And she said, Well, the way you've been acting, I was positive he had. How about your world? Will people know that God is alive by the way in which you and I live? You see, in order for them to know that God is alive, they're going to need to see some examples of courage and character in the lives of God's children. Are they seeing that at all? The third principle of hope, the, 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 the third principle of joy that Paul outlines in this is that adversity produces courage in our faith family. That's found in verses 14 and verse 20. It is evident that Paul's imprisonment had an effect on his associates. He was aware that many of them were very confident and bold because they saw his courage as he faced imprisonment. You see, bravery is contagious and persecution can be productive. One's to wonder what would have become of the first century church and the message of the gospel had it not been for persecution. It was often the, the impetus to all evangelism, in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 and 4, the scriptures read like this. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, and it started in Jerusalem. 
and all the Christians were scattered. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere hiding. Is that what the verse says? It does not. It says they went everywhere preaching the word. The persecution that you thought, that Rome thought, would stop the spread of faith in Jesus Christ, promoted it. It sent people who they thought they were scaring off to other parts of the world, and they shared their faith in Christ right where they found themselves. This is a story from Mark Addis, since he's from England. And this, Anthony, it's for you as well. Okay? All right. Debbie, it's for you as well. Dang, they're taking over. <laughs> In the 17th century England, George Fox, you recognize that name? Good Englishman. And the Quakers, they were making their mark for the gospel and thousands were coming to know Jesus Christ in their country. In the midst of this revival, while preaching at the castle of Carlisle in the north of England, George Fox was arrested on charges of blasphemy. After his trial, he was thrown into a filthy dungeon overrun with vermin and criminals. No one was allowed even a glimpse of him. Some who tried to bring him food were clubbed by the jailers. But 150 miles away, a 16-year-old teenager by the name of James Parnell, and this will, not be, um, this will not be politically correct terminology, but I'm reading right from a history book. James Parnell, a cripple, endowed with a brilliant mind, 16 years old, heard about Fox's situation, and he walked the entire 150 miles to the prison. Somehow, where others couldn't, Parnell managed to get in, and he was never, ever the same again. Says Walter Williams in his volume on Quaker history, after he and George Fox spent some time of fellowship together, the lad left Carlisle Dungeon with his heart aflame, and he gave the rest of his life to Christ and the Friends Movement. Another biography written about Parnell it says it this way, Parnell was young and small of stature and poor in appearance, but thousands in England came to confess because they said that Parnell spoke as one with authority, not as the scribes and the Pharisees. Parnell was convinced of the truth of Christ when he was only 14 years old, and after meeting with George Fox, he became a mighty preacher and promoter of the gospel at 16 Following a debate with a prominent priest, he's taking on the Church of England at the time. Got to think, wow, this guy's 30, 40, 50 years old. He's taking on the head, all right, of the church in England at the time. After that debate was over, Parnell was arrested on spurious charges of being an idle and disorderly person. He was imprisoned in Colchester Castle. Did I say it correctly? Somewhat close, all right. There he was confined into a small hole in the thick castle wall, 12 feet above the ground. And he died in that hole from a sickness and ill treatment after 10 months imprisonment at the young age of 19. According to a store in William Sewell, so great was the malice and the envy of his persecutors that to cover their guilt and shame, they spread among the people that he died because of immodest fasting and afterwards too greedy an appetite. But that was a wicked lie. James Parnell, in three years, was courageous and fearless about his faith in Jesus Christ. And he spurred on the Quaker movement for another hundred years. In my lifetime, I have felt on rare occasions the infectious impact of courageous suffering. I remember the story of Jim Elliott in Ecuador, and I've shared that story with you. And another book I'll recommend to you, if you've never read it, is Through Gates of Splendor. It is not a very thick book. You can get it in a paperback. You can go online and download it. It is worth your read. Written by his wife, Elizabeth Elliott. Jim Elliott was killed on a river as he and his fellow missionary men, friends, were on their way to share with a cannibalistic tribe called the Aka Indians. They were slaughtered in their boat in the middle of the river. After the funerals and the burials, 
and everything was over, the wives of those men all went back to the tribe who had killed their husbands. And the story goes that in just a matter of months, the whole tribe gave their life to Jesus Christ. Courage and fearlessness in the midst of challenge. A story that is not as familiar, but I do remember reading about it, was Paul Carlson. Paul Carlson was a Californian born in Culver City of Swedish immigrants. He graduated from North Park University in 1948, earned his bachelor's degree in anthropology from Stanford in 1951, and he finished medical school at George Washington University in 1956. Had to be a pretty smart guy, didn't he? Stanford and uh, George Washington University. In 1961, Carlson decided to serve as a missionary doctor, and he arrived in the Congo and began working as a medical missionary for six months in Ubagambi province. In July of 1963, along with his wife and his son Wayne and his daughter Lynette, he returned to the Yubani region of the African nation known at that time as the Republic of the Congo. It's now known as the Democratic Republic of the Congo. And just a side note, through a friend of Brent Sarabian, our newest elder and youngest elder on our church board. I've been invited in June to go and speak to congressmen in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Don't know if I'm going yet, but I've had the invitation. But remember this place. This is the same country this story is about. Activities included working in an 80-bed hospital in a leper colony. During this time, Carlson acquired the nickname Maganga Paul. Maganga means doctor. This work continued until the political unrest at that time had reached them. And in August of 1964, rebels captured Stanleyville, and the Carlson family escaped uh, across the Ubangi River to seek refuge in the Central African Republic. Carlson, however, remained committed to his hospital, and he returned back to Oslo. This final return placed him in the middle of the political unrest, and he soon fell into the hands of the communist-inspired Congolese rebels of the Simba Rebellion. His home was looted, the hospital and other buildings were damaged, and two of his staff members were shot and killed. Under the unstable leadership of Christophe Beignet, the rebels accused Carlson of being an American spy, and they took him hostage to Stanleyville. Carlson was held there, was mentally and physically abused and tortured. In November of 1964, negotiations for their release began to break down. It's upon the breakdown of those negotiations that paratroopers were flown in, and the rebels panicked. And on November the 24th, Thanksgiving week of 1964, Satsemba's soldiers opened fire into a crowd. Carlson and several others ran to a wall in hope of escaping. Before Carlson could scale the wall, he urged and assisted in a pastor, a clergyman, getting over the wall first. And as soon as he started climbing the wall, he was shot and killed by rebel gunfire. Carlson became known as the Congo Martyr. He was featured on both the covers of Time and Life magazines. His, tomb, his tombstone in Carrara bears this inscription, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Courage. It is designed to inspire and to offer hope. Someone said courage is grace under pressure. It is John Wayne said, who said, the great theologian, Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is being afraid and saddling up anyway. Lloyd John Ogilvie, one time pastor of Hollywood's First Presbyterian Church and then, and then chaplain of the United States Senate, said the most powerful historical proof of the resurrection is the resurrected disciples. Dull, defeated people became fearless and adventuresome leaders. Cowards became courageous. The timid became bold. The inept did the impossible. He is risen, became the joyous chant of a new life without limits. Are you willing to live your life without limits, without fear, courageously? We need more Carlsons to encourage us on. We need more Jim Elliots to spur us on in sharing our faith. You and I must seek courage and strength to move out of our comfort zones, and we will need it. Even the smallest of changes, even they are for the best, even though they are for the best, it disrupts our relational systems. Without courage, without trusted companions, growth and maturity often will never, ever happen. 
It was in 1957 and no, 1947, and nobody had broken the sound barrier yet. Any of you alive in 1947? Okay, half a dozen of you. There were very few that thought it could be done. Some thought it literally was a wall that nobody could ever break through, 760 miles an hour. Some thought no matter how well a plane was built, it would literally be smashed to pieces if it went through the barrier. Chuck Yeager, a name many of you will recognize, he was invited to be the test pilot to break the sound barrier. Colonel Bodie, his superior, said to him, nobody knows for sure what will happen until somebody gets there. Chuck, you'll be flying into the unknown. After nine attempts on October the 14th, 1947, Jaeger finally broke the sound barrier. He later wrote about that moment. He said, I was thunderstruck. After all of the anxiety, breaking the sound barrier turned out to be a perfectly paved speedway. After all the anticipation, it was a letdown. The unknown was like poking a hole in jello. And often our fears make barriers look bigger and harder and more difficult. But when with courage and faith we step out of our comfort zones, we often look back and say, why did I wait so long? This was so cool. Our fears are often overwhelmed and our courage is often run out because we cannot see the outcomes of the choices of our beliefs and our actions. Uncertainty about the outcome discourages us from even taking action. Bill Hybels, who wrote Courageous Leadership, uses the following story to maybe help us change our perspective. Bill Hybels was a sailor from the time that he was just a kid, and he owns a very, very nice sailboat. And every summer, his sailing crew, and he would have to deliver his sailboat by water to various harbors on the Great Lakes for their regattas. Some of them were a long ways away from his home port. Sometimes he ran into storms out in the middle of the Great Lake, and they were challenging. And more than once, he wondered, will I make it safely to harbor? And then he reminds himself of a different perspective. You see, Bill not only liked to, to, to fly across the surface of the water, but Hybels loved to fly in the bright blue skies. And he got his pilot's license as a teenager, and many times he would fly all around Lake Michigan and the Great Lake area. He knew where every port was. And so he said, when I would be in a storm in my sailboat and I think I wasn't going to make it, it's at that moment in the midst of those ugly conditions when I would change my perspective from sailor to sky jockey to a pilot. Because I would remember from up above, the storms never looked very bad down below. I remember from flying a plane that the harbor was smooth as silk, though there was a storm out over the middle of the lake. And I remember what things looked like from up above, and the waves became manageable. He said, believe it or not, with that viewpoint in mind, I could hang in there. I could keep going. I can believe that I'm going to make it, providing that I, I persevere. But I need that other perspective to give me hope and a renewed determination. That's second story living, folks. That's second story perspective. If all we look at are things from down here, then we'll always be scared. But if we get a view from up here, God gives us courage. The last five or six minutes. Let me wrap up with the second point of the day. Adversity proves the character of our relationships. It not only promotes our courage, but it proves the character of our relationship. As Paul looked out upon the church, he saw some encouraging things happening, but he also saw some discouraging things. He saw not only those who were supporting him in his difficulties in verse 16, but also those who were taking advantage of his trials and attempting to keep him down. These were not false teachers because Paul said they preached Christ. He rejoiced in the message they preached, but he was grieved in the manner in which they were doing so. They, they preached out of envy and partisanship. Paul chose not to dwell on what they did to him. We don't know exactly what it all was, but we know that their private lives were not consistent with their public lives. Character. It does count. 
As Paul described those who were preaching for the wrong reasons, he used a very interesting word. He said they were preaching out of selfish ambition, or if you have a King James, I believe it says contention. That word in the Greek literally means to canvas for office in order to get people to support you. What does that sound like? Politicians. Yeah. And, and, and would I be remiss in saying that their public life and their private life always match? And so these preachers in that generation were being compared to politicians. Their aim was to get people to follow them, but Paul's aim in preaching was to get people to follow Christ. As Paul sorted this out, he tried to come to some resolution about the matter. He rejoiced that Christ was being preached, even if it was not the way he wanted it to be. He knew that though Christ might not honor the motive of the messenger, Christ would honor and bless the message of his word. You see, there are some folks even today who share Christ out of envy, rivalry, or personal gain. There is a selfish need for power and importance. They couldn't be a big fish in the world, so they come into religion in order to be a big fish in a smaller pond. Others, though, share Christ out of genuine love, not for others to follow them, not for fame or notoriety, but so that they will know the love of Jesus Christ just as the preacher does. You see, Paul no longer cared about how important he was. His only concern was how important is Christ. Charles Colson, I don't have time to read the excerpt today that I had prepared, but the book I showed you last week by Colson called Loving God. Uh, maybe next week I'll lead with a story out of here of how Colson's life changed from the first half to the second half of his life. The first half fully committed to his own advancement. The second half of his life up to his very last breath was in promoting Jesus Christ. And do you know what? Colson is known better today as the prison fellowship founder than he is for the Watergate instigator. You see, folks, I have a sad fact for you today. Just coming to church, New Hope Church or any church, won't change your character. Only coming to Christ will. That's what Martin Luther discovered in the Book of Romans. Just being a priest in the Catholic Church that didn't earn him any credit. Change came when he gave his life personally to Christ. Character will be developed in our lives when we stop seeking the presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S. -E -E when we stop seeking the presence, what we can get from God, and we start genuinely be concerned about enjoying his presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E, -E -E, of God with us. When people look at us, our character and our disposition should on a regular basis look more and more like that of Jesus Christ. There's a story from August 8th, 1990, edition of Our Daily Bread that illustrates this closing point. The discipleship journal writer by the name of Carol Mayhall tells of a woman who walked into a diet center to lose weight. The director took her to a full-length mirror, mirror and had her stand in front of it. On it, he outlined a figure and he told her, this is the figure I want you to look like when you end the program. Days of very intense dieting and exercise followed. And every week the woman would stand in front of that mirror and there were days she was so discouraged because her outline didn't fit into the director's ideal. But week after week, month after month, until a little over a year had passed, she stood in front of that mirror and she fit perfectly inside the outline. She had been conformed to the long-desired image. Those of you who are Christians, here is your mirror. The Scripture says that it's the desire of God the Father 
to shape and conform us into the image of his dear son. And the image of Christ is outlined for us in the scriptures. If this seems too thick for you to manage as an outline for your life, may I encourage you that you just go to Galatians chapter 5. Go to the last few verses of the chapter. It's, it's got a title in front of it. It says, The Fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, goodness, gentleness, meekness, kindness. See how your spiritual shape fits to the image of the one that God says, this is who I want you to be. And if you'll let me, it'll be easier than a diet plan. You see, we face trials and difficulties in life. What's our perspective? Lower story, sailing ship. Upper story, airplane. Changes our view. Whether I live or whether I die, I will be delivered. A life of encouragement, a life of courage, and a life that adversity improves our character. I want us to close the way that every Celebrate Recovery meeting I've ever attended closes. I'm going to ask you all to do something you don't like to do. I'm going to ask you to repeat after me out loud. You don't have to mean it. You don't. It's okay. This is a group activity. If you mean it, it will be personal therapy. If you don't mean it, you just made me happy. Whatever that might not be worth to you. But every Celebrate Recovery ends with a prayer written by Reinhold Niebuhr. You've probably seen it somewhere. It's on plaques. It's on walls. It's on posters. It's called the Serenity Prayer. But it's a good way for us to conclude today's message, particularly as we've talked about courage and character. Are you ready? I'll give you part of a line. I will look up. You repeat that line after me. Oh, Milo's going to make this really easy. He thinks I should have told him I was doing this. How long will it take you? So while he's doing that, I know you didn't mean that comment the way it sounded. <laughs> Unblanked, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, I know. I'm playing with you, Milo. It would have been funnier if Kepler was here. Okay, all right. Um, forget that part. He tried. Good job, Milo. Here we go. I'm going to give you the line, and you'll repeat it after me. All right? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. The courage to change the things I can. And the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time. Enjoying one moment at a time. Accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. Taking this sinful world as it is. Not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right. If I surrender to your will. So that I may be reasonably happy in this life. And supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. And if you believe that, that is life changing. And if you've never accepted Christ into your life in a personal relationship before, there's your prayer right there. God, I want you to come live in me and be in me who I can never be 
all on my own and give me courage and character to carry out this life. God bless you. Have a great day. We'll pick up with the last three points next week.